So according to the schedule, I have to give some summary remarks. And uh, it won't be too long. But I also wanted to express gratitude again to the moderators for you all being here, and especially to the graduating class. I really learned so much about dedication, teamwork, love. Um, you have no idea the endless revisions, the rehearsals to get to this seamless moment, and they really shined. So congratulations. Let's congratulate them. Amazing. <laughs> And thank you, Amanda, for inspiring me to redo my backyard. <laughs> and um, just like Carolina's parrot, I'm going to give, offer you some um, food for thought. So I'm just going to go by and you know just extend the responses. So f for Jamie, um, but I think in all of the panels and papers, as you see, they're quite divergent and diverse and quite deep. But a thing that goes throughout is to that they all think about ways to rethink and embody um, modes of being um, ethical within an aesthetic frame, right? Because we are in a time of crisis, and how do we respond, and what are our responsibilities in this response, right? And so deeply, each one of their presentations really kind of enunciate different modes of being, um, and just beyond this idea of resistance, right? Viet Thanh Nguyen, the other Viet who won a Pulitzer this year, in this um, book called Race and Resistance, talks about this idea of resistance that we always, often for minoritarian subjects, read or want to read resistance, right? And so they're talking about different tools and new tools, I mean, to paraphrase poorly Audre Lorde, but, you know, dismantling, you know, a master's house, but creating new tools and new language beyond this mode of resisting or not resisting, decolonizing or not decolonizing. And so I think this opens up avenues and spaces um, which think about ambivalence and you know, grief and love. So for the individual papers, I'm just gonna quickly go through this. Um, Jamie, I feel your queer exhaustion. Um, you know, I think we're all feeling it. And to really think about, as you quote Butler, you are what I gain, right? In this loss, you are what I gain. But to really think about what is it we gain or what is it we lose? David Kazanji and David Eng really talk about this idea of you know loss is a productive space, and I disagree. Like loss may not be a productive space. You're just grieving. You have no language, and your presentation opens that you know I'm unable to be there. I'm apart, but not apart. Um, and also, John Luke Nancy talks about community, and community is a term that comes up through all the presentations. That it is through the loss of others that we kind of understand community. So how do we transform our notions of community and loss and longing? For Christians to think about illness and this idea of disease, um, Anne Zvekovic writes about um, in depression, this, the kind of Foucauldian notions of what do we mean by disease? She writes about depression, you're writing about breast cancer, but you know, if you are a particular subjectivity, right, of course you're gonna be depressed because of the structural oppressions, and this is something that Anne Cheng talks about too in Racial Melancholia, of course, you're gonna feel fucked up and sad and pissed off because it is these things, and it's not, you know, it becomes pathologized, and I think your uh, presentation points that out and to really think about what are the frameworks, and also to push you to think about, I know it's highly personal too, to enunciate what are your claims in the work as well. Uh, for Lindsay, thinking about repetition and alteration and as reparatives, right, in this Apollinean Dionysian framework. And what does it mean um, to be ambivalent between the two poles? And other uh, theorists, Lisa Lowe writes about this idea of ambivalence and as this figure um, that kind of troubles these binaries or these frames within the community. So the ambivalent, she's talking about this racialized figure, but this ambivalent figure who appears on the scene but becomes visible only through the cohesion community. So what does it mean for you or through the text or reading the text? What does this position of ambivalence uh, possess, right? For so this um, panel two, almost there, two thirds way or whatever. Th uh, okay, so querying Aslan, which is I think incredibly profound, Gilda, and important and thinking through intersectionality and you know, Chicana X. 
and this question about performativity, but I really want to, um, and then of course, back to Munoz and disidentifying these multiple modes, but I really want to think through in your response and Karen's query about, um, you know, what do we mean by social practice, right? How do we define social practice versus a relational aesthetics? I know we're kind of famous, infamous, if you Google CCA, there's a social practice program, which is highly ranked, but what does it mean, right, um, to engage in social practice, because Claire Bishop actually really questions that beyond, she says that social practice or relational aesthetics has a long problematic history of not being able to sustain itself, of being complicit, you know, artists that come and do these interventions, uh, that they are basically absorbed by the museum, their institutional critique. So how do we, and your kind of framework of, okay, I'm going to reown this to really think through what is, what is the intervention? What is the, um, you know, what is your move beyond just, okay, this is outside and then we're gonna reclaim this. For Angela, framing and unframing, um, and I love your framework of WET, W-E-T, and W-H-E-T, and with the W-E-T, uh, you're talking about this idea of yielding, right, and then these images, these gendered images of kind of Venus on the water and WET, this, what you say, a sharpening but stimulation. And I was also thinking about, thinking about the resisting um, or thinking more about gender and actually because within the sublime, this notion, traditional notion of discourses and sublime, there's such a component of sexuality that comes out to, in your framework, to how to kind of add that or retweak it. And I think you, um, the framework is about questioning these protects perspectival visions and these frameworks as well, but again, yielding and unyielding, there's a certain kind of component of sexuality and gender that perhaps can be enunciated more. Um, and then, oh, one last thing about thinking about these frameworks. Akira Lippitt in Atomic Light and Shadow really talks about this moment of disorientation, just to also go back to Jamie's in this um, atomic blast, but, but thinking about representational um, modes and regimes, which is your word, Andrea. Um, so how does it unfix things? Okay, last panel, number three. Ooh, um, knowledge and production. So Amanda, in the very last slides, when you were talking about these racialized bodies, um, and then contrasted with the wicker chairs and these people, in the very last slides, these people, both the racialized bodies and the tourists um, or the domesticated, domesticating sites are not in the images. You know, maybe your mom when, or your whoever relatives when they were redoing the backyard, uh, you know, had this mental vision. But what does it mean that these images, that these people are erased, both the racialized ones and then the non-racialized one? And in the book, Domestica really talks about um, because this labor is invisible, but it does take labor and upkeep to maintain these systems, right? To really think about what does it mean that all these backyards have no people now, right? And this invisible empire. Becca, um, beautiful reading. And again, to press on this idea of heterotopia, you said the mirror, the spoon is a heterotopic space, but once again, the museum itself is a heterotopic space. So in the museum space, that you are, as Foucault puts it, you know, the prison, et cetera, the library, are these spaces that are liminal. But in the museum space, or in the space of the mirror, as he puts it, versus Lacan, um, it shifts that it's a sort of doubling. And so how does that change and how does that shift? And then you mentioned Derrida and this idea of the logos or language, and you kind of really question, uh, you know, could, you italicize the could. So when Derrida is talking about the archive, it's really about you know this masculine patriarchal institutional structure which you talk about with the museums. But what does it mean? And he, when he talks about archive fever, that we actually become um, enamored, complicit with this archive and the slippages that happen within the archive. And to think through, perhaps as the methodology, um, perhaps ethnography to position yourself because we're all complicit. And then finally, um, Carolina, just to think about, because it's about this global and this idea of the accent, the idea of um, legibility, global art markets, and of course, um, I can't say, say this because of my bad Vietnamese accent, Neuschwander, uh, 
this globalized artist, but then what does it mean, how is she read within a quote unquote local context? For, for instance, some Asian artists um, are positioned in the West as representative of XYZ, or of course this year's Documenta, or even Venice Biennale with these national pavilions. So these artists strategically position themselves. But what does it mean when they are making work at home or in Brazil? How are they read and what is the critical response? Um, in closing, just again, let's you know celebrate everyone. It's amazing. I mean, I really, it's so much love, so much respect. Thank you. Hi, I'm back. Um, just kidding. So I have to introduce Sienna. Of course, everyone knows Sienna, who was just here last year and did amazing. And she's going to introduce everybody. Sienna, of course, VCS program um, manager who makes this all possible. Hello. Um, congratulations again to everyone who presented today. You guys are awesome. Um, so I'm here to introduce the VCS Alumni Award, um, or give a little background about the award. Uh, the VCS Alumni Award, also known as the Viz Crit Alumni Award, serves to recognize a VCS alum whose work after graduation from CCA exemplifies the interdisciplinary and socially engaged values of the VCS program, as well as the nimbleness and ongoing scholarship required to operate within the ever-changing field of visual and critical studies. This award recognizes the innovative and diverse ways that VCS alumni mobilize the skills they honed and ideas they germinated while at CCA in a broad range of creative and professional arenas, further evidencing the versatility of the degree and the luminosity of this community. The 2014 graduating cohort established the VCS Alumni Award as a way to reach out to VCS alumni and to create a more engaged, robust VCS community network. To that end, each year's graduating VCS cohort is responsible for selecting that year's award recipient. We honor the awardee here at the program's end of year thesis event, the Spring Symposium, and in the recognition of their achievements, invite them to address the VCS community. The awardee will also present their work in the fall at a VCS forum. Additionally, the awardee will be profiled by a VCS student on the VCS website. Lastly, we, pre we present the recipient of the VCS Alumni Award with the coveted VCS bronze pencil. <laughs> Commissioned by the VCS program, this solid bronze pencil is produced by CCA's own foundry, sorry, CC's own foundry, but by students under the tutelage of Professor Clay Jensen. I now invite the VCS graduating cohort of 2017 to the stage to present the 2017 VCS Alumni Award. Um, Carolina and Gilda will give a brief introduction of this year's recipient. Michelle Carlson, congratulations. The 2017 VCS cohort is proud to present you with the VCS Alumni Award. Do you want to go come up to the stage? <laughs> she just looks like another student. Okay. Um, we are proud to offer you this award because we believe that you embody the life of a dual degree to its capacity and beyond. This is the first time the entire graduating cohort is composed only of dual degrees, so you are particularly special to us. We admire you for your extensive knowledge on interdisciplinary experiences and approaches. We appreciate your willingness to share experiences and knowledges of the world with the people that surround you. To us, you are an example of how community building happens through love, care, and collaborative th critical thinking. We value your, your teachings represented in the, in the words you t have told us, make the art world you want to see. So let me, I'll turn awkwardly around. Okay. Let me introduce Michelle Carlson to you, her life and achievements. She is difficult to summarize in a few wor words because as many of us do all degrees, she wears many hats. Carlson is a practicing artist, writer, educator, and curator whose transdisciplinary transdisciplinar research approach in investigates the inter intersections of history, laws, power, and visual culture. 
Carlson was born in Korea, but grew up in Seattle, where she attended the University of Washington. With a dual interest since her early stages, she received a BFA in printmaking and a BA in interdisciplinary visual arts and history. After her undergraduate work, she moved to San Francisco Bay Area, where she completed a dual degree in MFA in printmaking and an MA in visual critical studies in 2007, right here in our CCA. Her thesis, Home is Where, You're, Where We Stand, Transnational Adoptees and Racial Melancholia, is an exploration of memory and the search of home as an ongoing process. As an artist, his, her visual work consists of primarily collage drawings and paper, where intricate black and white patterns mer merge with vessels, dresses, and falling columns. Her work has been exhibited nationally and venues including the Patricia Sweeton Gallery in San, the San Francisco Arts Commission, Intersection for the Arts, and Sarasoli Gallery in LA. She has received awards and fellowships from Cala Art Institute, San Francisco Arts Commission, and the Reader's Digest Museum Foundation. She is currently working on a memoir drawing connections between visiting her younger brother in prison over the course of seven and a half years with her own experience as a kid in the system. An orphan left on the side of the road in Korea where she was six months old and adopted into a white family in 1981. Her current work explores institutionalization and how it shapes kinship, the formation of family, and power. Aside from her solo practice, Carlson has, has the privilege of being one third of a related tactics collective whose projects operate at, at the intersection of art, race, and culture. They are currently starting a print online publication and organi organizing a few projects around the rhetoric of the hustle for 2017. In addition to her visual work, Carlson has a writing practice. Her critical writings and creative writings have been published in numerous publications, including Art in America, Hyphen, Art Practical, and After Image, and various exhibition catalogs. She is a regular contri contributor to KQED Arts, where she writes about art and digital culture. Aside from her visual work and writing practice, Carlson has served as editor-in-chief for Hyphen, a national print and online publication focusing on Asian American culture and politics. She continues her dedication to the API community and beyond by continuing to serve on the advisory board for Hyphen, which is currently the old only and oldest media organization specifically holding space for Asian American arts and culture. Carlson also sits on the Center of, for Art and Public Lives board. Most recently, Carlson took the role of executive director for, of Daily Serving in Art Practical in her new role, Carlson has continued her relentless dedication towards fighting to create an art world that is inclusive of many experiences, and above everything else, an art world that envisions a world in which we want to live in, a world that is not afraid to challenge institutions, a world that interrogates funding, and a world that dismantles privilege. Although she does not call herself a curator, Carlson does think on several curatorial projects, most recently, she co-curated Estamos Contra el Muro, Ed Muro, <laughs> We Are Against the Wall, at Southern Exposure. She is currently a member of this institution's curatorial committee, and sh she helped to create the inaugural Southern Exposure Ardor Writers Fellowship Program. Carlson also collaborates with artist and poet Matthew Gordon on Harry and Ernie, a moniker that offers the conceptual space to create editions, artist books, chapbooks, and other tangible ephemera. Carlson hosts an, the imprint related tactics, which entertains diverse projects that aim to support artists of color, particularly within the field of art writing and criticism. Lastly, she teaches here in the Graduate of Fine Arts and Visual Critical Studies departments. She was recently appointed Associate Professor in BCS, and her courses provide space for artists to learn about transdisciplinary disciplinary practices, critical race studies, and artistic production. Michelle Carlson, today we would like to say thank you. Thank you for living through the life of a nonprofit cultural worker and bridging gaps into institutions. Thank you for providing an example to many women of color who find themselves in the arts, lots and confused, with a sense of not belonging. Thank you for showing us that our experiences are valid. 
and, what we and that we deserve to cross into these platforms and question the world. Thank you for sustaining many stages to which to do the work. Michelle Carlson, today we honor you for doing the work. bronze pencil. <laughs> Thank you. So you don't have to stand. Do you, are you comfortable standing behind me? Like, what do you want? Okay, you're good? <laughs> I don't know. It's up to you. <laughs> yeah, please, please stay with me. Um, I like it. Um, Thank you so much uh, for this amazing honor. Gilda, Carolina, thank you so much for the beautiful intro. I know, um, you know, in addition to um, preparing your thesis and preparing for today and then having to kind of compile more things to talk about, I really appreciate it. This award means so much to me because I'm so honored to be a part of this community. And by the presentations of research we saw today, you know, just really thrilled to see the complex ways that the world of VCS continues to expand every year. And I know there's been a lot of chatting, and I know everyone who comes up here is like, I swear well, this is gonna be the last one. Um, but I, I say that again. And um, uh, one of the things I've come to learn about VCS is that they know how to throw a party. So don't worry, that's coming soon. Um, but I do love a good microphone, and uh, mostly uh, I don't take enough opportunities to actually kind of express my gratitude and respect to the folks who came before me um, and whose careers and practices continue to make it possible for me to do any of the work that I do. Um, I graduated in, as a dual degree in 2007, so which I feel, yeah, I, thank you. Uh, go 2007. Um, we were actually the only, we were the sixth class of VCS as a whole. Um, and back then it wasn't even called visual and critical studies, it was called visual criticism. Um, and dual degree students were a new and terrifying concept. Uh, there had only been two other dual degrees uh, before our class and their program was four years long, not the condensed three. Um, nothing was formalized, you couldn't apply to be a dual degree, um, not, it wasn't on the website, and really most everybody was literally like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, you're, why are you here for three years? Uh, did you do something bad? Um, and um, you really had to be kind of invited by the current chair of the program and the founder of the program, um, the brilliant and unstoppable Lydia Matthews. And the dual degrees of my class, there were four of us, and we didn't know what we were getting into. Um, there was no model, and of course, we had no idea that we were walking into uncharted territory. Um, but we, I think we really would have probably just followed Lydia Matthews off of any cliff that she led us to, and we did, we all, four of us did. Um, and it was sort of this awe-inspiring mess. Uh, the department had to customize each of our three years individually. Kate Angelo, our heroic program manager at the time, literally built and rebuilt our curriculum, like piece by piece, solved administrative problems for us sometimes daily. Um, because we didn't fit into the system of the college. And by trying to do something new, we often ended up in the margins of the college, uh, if not totally forgotten. The subject line of many frustrated administrative emails, meetings, calls, simply because we didn't fit. There wasn't a legible model for us to just snap neatly, neatly into. We were messy. And VCS, this tiny department, simply cared enough to go to the trouble to fight for our mess. And that spirit to fight for illegibility when it means disrupting the norm had a profound effect on me, particularly because it was coupled with this like fierce care for myself, uh, for my work, my research, my professional development. We could see and feel people working for our place in the college, working against the institutional and categorical desire that wanted us to just please fit into a pre-existing tidy box you know, because it seemed to make more sense, or it was easier that way, or because it was simply something new and hard that they'd never seen before. And over and over, VCS asked the college to undo itself, 
simply so that we could fit until we did. And for me, at that point in my life, uh, that was radical. Since grad school, I have found comfort in an active discomfort, in the illegible. This space is at the core of my practice. I learned so much about that from my time in BCS, both as a student and now as faculty. I learned how to not be overcome by my own creative and critical research practice, the way or in way of life that may not always um, that may not always make categorical sense or may not fit neatly into the rules of like this world or that world. Um, rules that are typically set up only so certain folks can succeed, right? Because only certain folks have access to learn those rules. I learned to breathe deeply in the discomfort of tackling research projects, materials, questions that have no legs to stand on except my own hunch, or the prolonged discomfort to embody the exhausting work of support and advocacy, and to distinguish between support and advocacy's nuances. As a faculty member, uh, Tirza wasn't um, the chair of the program when I was there. Um, so my experience with Tirza has largely been as a faculty member. And Tirza and my colleagues in BCS have taught me this, this difference between support and advocacy, that support is significant, but that is not the same as advocacy. And to bear witness to their continued fight to bring me, other colleagues, students, and the program itself out of the margins and into the light um, as the great thinker, philosopher, poet, Shonda Rhimes might say. <laughs> there's there's going to be more scandal later. Just stay tuned. Um, I have learned from them that if I want to make, if I want to, as um, Carolina mentioned, I say a lot, apparently, um, that if I want to make the art world, I want to see my work must happen in the messy space of discomfort. When I was in school, I thought that my thesis was like totally a fluke. Um, I'd never written about or done any work around issues that were so rooted in my own personal narrative. In the fine art world that I came from, we were always taught not to do this, um, especially if you were an artist of color for fear of ending up being pigeonholed as like the Asian artist. Um, what I didn't know then was that that would happen anyway, um, and I just wouldn't get to control the narrative of my own work or my own body. But that was the point. Right? Like that is the part of the methodology of systemic racism, small invisible moments where my own narrative is told for and to me. And BCS really taught me about how power quietly creeps through language and how language is one of the most violent weapons to be wielded. And I ended up writing this thesis that was an autoethnography on the methodology of transnational and transracial adoptee and adoption narratives, language. Uh, this was a profound, exposing, and very conspicuous project for me because even when I wasn't writing about my own experiences as an adoptee, everyone assumed that I was. And even though my research may have negotiated the psychic landscape of trauma, uh, I wasn't actually writing about my own trauma. Uh, but no one, like no one believed me, ever. Um, <laughs> except for people in BCS. And uh, no one understood the complexity of criticism, right, except for in BCS that while messy, one could use personal narratives to critique systemic narratives without it actually being about you. And in BCS, as a student, professors Tina Takamoto, Mabel Wilson, Lydia Matthews, David Eng, Karen Fiss, uh, taught and modeled for me a type of critical bravery, that to be a critic in the world meant to be brave and to be sure, even if it gets messy, and perhaps especially when it gets messy. And then they wouldn't let me off the hook like they never let me off the hook as I'm sure many of you know. And no one modeled that more for me than Tina Takamoto, whose own practice demonstrated this like gutsy and fearless use of the personal in order to speak to the political that just took my breath away as a student and still, of course, continues to. Uh, the thesis that I wrote, wrote for BCS was like 70 pages long. Sorry, sorry, Tina. Uh, and I, I never redistributed that writing anywhere in other places, meaning that the writing for the thesis is since just existing gathering dust in the library, like literally right down this hallway. Um, and I say it like that because um, this is how, or this is what the students kind of, or some students often warily and kind of self-consciously uh, joke about, that no one will ever read their thesis and it will just sit gathering dust in the library forever, uh, for eternity. But often student, students say this to me and then later offer me the like horrifying experience 
of coming to me with my own thesis that they've just read, like the, their fingers still dusty, right? Um, and they, I think they often forget or don't realize because I am their teacher that I am also them, right? I'm also you. Um, and to be honest, I have always thought that it's kind of a feat, right? To have written something that might be sitting on a shelf waiting to be read right down a hallway somewhere. And so while the writing of my thesis sits and kind of waits, the research that drove my thesis has taken countless expanded forms that have largely come from my own dismantling of any expectations or assumptions of what a viz critter uh, ought to be doing in order to create a practice that only I could do using a set of tools versus a set of rules. And my thesis research has you know, kind of become college seminars, the foundation for visual work, talks, conversations, collaborations, but most importantly, it has built relationships. And I'm constantly surprised by how often I can draw connections back to this thesis that I thought was, totally thought was a fluke, that I thought I would never look at again. And the life it has had since I graduated was not a legible path, um, but it was an unexpected, unexpected, messy, and full life. Recently, I had this kind of unexpected breakthrough on a book project that I've been working on for a couple of years. Um, Carolina mentioned it. It's writing that I thought had nothing to do with my thesis. Um, it never actually even dawned on me that it was related at all. Um, and I, I've been writing a series of essays about visiting my younger brother in prison um, across Washington State uh, over his term of seven and a half years. And last summer, I was participating in Kearney Street walk Workshops, Interdisciplinary Writers Workshop, and the writer that was running the creative nonfiction section, me section um, met with me to discuss this writing. And we sat in that like grossly bougie Twitter building. There was like a $15 waffle between us. Waffle, not waffles. $15 waffle in San Francisco. Um, and she pulled the draft from her bag, like out of her bag and she like waved it at me like this, um, which was great. Um, and, you know, she waved it at me so I could, like, see the blood dripping from my writing that had been cut open by her, like, red pen, you know. And she slammed the draft onto the table, and, you know, as the whipped cream fell from the $15 <laughs> waffle, she asked me a very simple question, which was, why are you writing this? And I couldn't answer her. Partly, I think it's because of the waffle, but, I, you know, it's a big, bigger issue. I sat in discomfort for months with that very simple question. Why are, you, why are you making this? Why are you writing this? And I also realized the karmic retribution because I know that's like a question I ask students all the time. <laughs> so I, get, I understand what was happening. Um, and it was, the, it was that kind of feedback. Uh, this is why we asked this question. It was like that kind of feedback that rendered me paralyzed. You know, like I couldn't write anything or make anything for like longer than I should have been able to. Um, but over time, it was, it was really important because I realized that this writing that felt so disparate, of course, um, was an extension of my thesis research um, to center concerns about how family, kinship, and belonging are institutionalized, right, whether through adoption or incarceration, the in prison industrial complex, um, but within the negotiation of complex systems of racial grief, right, and at the forefront of that, of course, racial grievance. And of course, like my thesis, it was a combo of creative writing and critical analysis. And of course, like my thesis, it draws heavily on the personal as a generative space in which I may attempt to unpack structural narratives and systems. So of course, this discovery was messy, but messy is radical, right? It's subversive. It undermines the systems that rely on legibility to make visible those who do not fit, right? So that they may be kept to the margins. Messy is profoundly human and of the things that are impossible to reduce. So for the cohort of 2017, I hope you all get your own mess. Uh, one that undermines everything you have just been taught in place for what only you can do. Thank you so much. Okay, hi, we're almost there. Um, my name is Tina Takamoto. I've been teaching here in visual and critical studies and in visual studies for quite a while. Um, so, as you know, the bronze pencil is the highest honor bestowed upon an individual for their significant contributions to the graduate program in visual and critical studies. And I am delighted to introduce another one of this year's recipients, 
Terza True Latimer. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, I'm, I have to I have to speechify though. So just stand, right. stand, look good. Okay, okay. Um, so since fall of uh, 2007, Terza Latterman, Latimer has worked tirelessly to develop the breadth and depth of the VCS program by forging connections with other CCA programs and enabling students to earn a master's or certificate in VCS alongside their graduate degrees in fine arts, writing, curatorial practice, and architecture. So it, she made the whole formalized process possible. So we've got pathways, we've got pie charts, it's incredible. Um, sequencing, charts, sequencing charts, it's, yeah, it's all less messy. Terza has brought luminary scholars, including Jose Munoz, Pamela Lee, Guillermo Gomez Pena, Donna Haraway, Trin Min Ha, and Judith Butler to give public lectures and work directly with graduate students in the intimate setting of the VCS forums. She co-founded Queer Conversation on Culture and the Arts with the Queer Cultural Center and also um, spearheaded the On Our Minds Think Tank Research Public Lecture Series Extravaganza Group with the Wattis Institute for Contemporary Arts. And she um, brought art practical and daily serving within the walls of CCA. Most relevant to um, the stunning accomplishments displayed in today's symposium, Terza has worked closely with 94, 94 VCS graduate students over the past decade. Like our favorite high school gym coach, Terza provides, <laughs> wait, Terza, Terza provides the day-to-day -day calisthenics, guidance, mentorship, and encouragement. It's hard to say this really close to you. I think of this. <laughs> if you're too close to the gym coach, you get <laughs> nervous. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. All right. So um, the encouragement um, to keep the team going despite all kinds of adversity. But unlike the cheerleading coach played by Jane Lynch in the TV series Glee, Terza really sees the potentiality of each and every student, and she doesn't need to wear a whistle because she is a human whistle. <laughs> and she can use this whistle to rally the forces and to get each and every thesis project over the VCS symposium finish line, sometimes with just 30 seconds to spare. It's incredible. Miraculously, during her time as chair, Terza has also published over 30 essays, curated at least six exhibitions, presented nearly 500 lectures and conference papers. This is her CV as of 2014, which was the last CV that I, I had, uh, I thought I could look at, um, and co-authored an award-winning book, Seeing Gertrude Stein's Five Stories, which was also an exhibition at the Con Contemporary Jewish Museum. Her most recent monograph, Eccentric Modernisms, Making Differences in the History of American Art, um, is recently published and will launch at Caddist on April 29th. Next Saturday. Next Saturday, everyone should come. Finally, I deeply value Terza's commitment to difference and cultural equity. She models this commitment in her teaching, curricular development, mentorship, um, committee service, recruitment of students and faculty, and most significantly in the conscientious and ethical manner in which she fosters an environment of mutual support, values diverse perspectives, and treats individuals with respect and dignity. And we have many, many amazing testimonials of people that you have worked with throughout the last decade. And so we'll be highlighting that video um, and other surprises in our reception. So stay tuned for that. Um, so now I'd like the entire class of 2017 to come up and join me in um, 
presenting the Bronze Pencil Award um, that has also uh, been specially crafted for the occasion. <laughs> it is sitting on a tiny gold custom chair <laughs> for the best chair ever. And it was designed by Sienna Freeman. Um, so, yes, yeah, so um, thank you. We honor you. And wow. Um, this, it, it, I'm speechless. Um, gosh, how did that happen? That's the first, right? Oh gosh, it, it, uh, I kind of am speechless. It's, um, this is the best, the best birthday present I've ever had. Um, and it's also uh, uh, the only trophy uh, th that I've ever had. And I couldn't think of, I, I mean, I couldn't have imagined a, a trophy that I would have ever wanted. So, um, it, you 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 imagined this, and um, I I accept it with um, I'll do um, humility and appreciation and respect for you. And I I just want to say about half of what uh, Tina read about my achievements um, uh, is news to me. But um, the part about um, my commitments, uh, um, I I. I want to acknowledge that um, I learned everything I know uh, about um, being a, a member of this community and lead, leading this community and being a collaborator from you. Um, and um, I, I'll never stop. Um, I'll never stop the learning that you've set in in motion. Um, and. I thank you for that. It's been in, in, um, beyond, uh, uh, beyond an honor and a real, a real joy and a real stretch uh, to, to keep up with you. Um, and I, I want to just a, a special thank you because, you know, um, as Tina always says, and I often repeat, it takes a village. Um, um, Tina is the sort of um, um, incarnation of, or, or personification of the village, uh, and all by herself. Um, she um, uh, manages to get um, a lot of work done behind the scene, scenes that um, have enabled all of us, I think, who, who, who know her and have worked with her in one way or another uh, to, to, to rise to our best potential. Um, to connect with each other, to um, have meaningful um, uh, uh, work uh, born into into the world, and and um, Tina, I just I I don't know how many people know this, but um, she just pestered Steve Beal until he agreed to hire me. So um, um, I'm sure it wasn't an easy sell. But I, uh, I owe it all to Tina. Um, so if you want to come and use the pencil, <laughs> or you know, probably you'll have your own um, someday. Um, and uh, anyway, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm close to tears, um, tears of joy. Thank you all.